We now begin chapter two, which asks the question, what is a patient? It's a very interesting question. We're going to look for answers from a number of different angles. The first of which is the ancient history of patients. We've all evolved. Events that happened long ago continue to have consequences for medicine. Here are a few of them. Asymmetric division is something that happened in bacterial cells more than three billion years ago, and that created the condition for the evolution of aging, and probably also for the maintenance of the germline. Stem cells are a great idea. They evolved to repair multicellular organisms when multicellularity originated sometime between one and two billion years ago. However, they are pre-adapted to become cancer cells. They contain some of our vulnerability to cancer. Retroviruses inserted into a proto-immunoglobulin gene about half a billion years ago, 500 million years ago. And that started the evolution of the vertebrate adaptive immune system. Highly invasive placentas evolved in the shared ancestor of orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans about 15 million years ago. They are associated with preeclampsia, which is dangerously high maternal blood pressure during pregnancy, and with the risk of metastatic cancer. So you can see that events occurring between three billion years ago and 15 million years ago continue to have implications for medicine. So let's begin to unpack these. We're going to return to these events in more detail when we discuss aging, cancer, adaptive immunity, and parent-offspring conflicts over parental investment. So first, asymmetric division. This is the condition for the evolution of aging. The idea is that if in division, one cell can be given the newer parts and the other cell the older parts, the cell lineage with the older parts will die out and the cell lineage with the newer parts will persist. This mechanism has been confirmed in a, a bacterium, E. coli, that appears to divide symmetrically. It turns out it does not. And it can explain the survival of the germline since the origin of life. If division were perfectly symmetrical, then it would be impossible for selection to dis distinguish between the mother and the daughter cell. They would both look identical. Both would be equally intact or equally damaged, and the reproductive payoff from improving the maintenance of both would be equal. However, as soon as the reproductive payoff of maintenance becomes smaller in the mother cell than in the daughter, the mother has reproduced, the daughter has not yet reproduced, the mother has the older parts, the daughter has the newer parts, then aging will evolve as a cost of reproductive performance. So selection will improve the cell that has more payoff in terms of future reproduction. Let's take a look at this in E. coli. Here you can see the old poles on the cell are in red, the new poles are in blue. As it goes through cell division, this becomes an old pole cell, this becomes a new pole cell. This sequence here leads to a new pole cell for at least two divisions. This one has been an old pole cell for at least two divisions. And if we follow this through, you can see a sequence of divisions over here. These are how long those lineages survive. You can see there's variation building up. On the x-axis here, we have the consecutive number of old or new pole cell divisions. On the y-axis, we have the normalized growth rate. And you can see that the ones with the new poles are growing faster than the ones with the old poles, and their advantage is getting larger and larger. The ones with the old poles are diverging and dying off faster the more old poles accumulate. The second ancient vulnerability in patients is stem cells. Stem cells originated with multicellularity. They're a great innovation, but they have characteristics that predispose them to cancer. They retain the potential to differentiate and move. That adapts them, pre-adapts them to a cancerous lifestyle. There are stem cells that are all over the body that are positioned to replace cells that wear out and are discarded, particularly in bone marrow, lungs, intestine, and skin. 
those are the tissues in which malignant cancer is most frequent. The next ancient innovation that continues to have medical consequences is the evolution of the immune system. Adaptive immunity was acquired about 500 million years ago. Here is a portion of the tree of life showing the vertebrates up here. And this is the transition between cephalochordates and agnathans. So these would be lampreys and hagfish and cephalochordates or lancets, amphioxus, things like that. And at this point, a virus inserted itself into a proto-immunoglobulin gene, and it brought with it transposon machinery, and that is what allows lymphocytes to generate diverse antigen receptors to recognize and to repel antigens. So that didn't come fully formed, it required subsequent evolution, but it's interesting that we got part of our ability to resist viruses from essentially a virus, a transposon. So the adaptive immune system evolved at that point with the invasion of a transposable genetic element. This is the transposable genetic element. This is the immunoglobulin gene here the transposase gene inserted into the middle of that immunoglobulin gene. It can be recognized by the fact that we can see this particular sequence in the receptor gene, and the transposase genes are now on separate chromosomes. So they're called RAG1 and RAG2. Subsequent evolution has moved them to a separate chromosome. So that event built into the gene, the machinery that's needed to carry out the somatic recombination that generates antibody diversity. We will be going into that in some detail when we come to our discussion of defenses. The next ancient event, about 15 million years ago, occurred when highly invasive placentas evolved in the great apes. Here you can see a phylogenetic tree focusing just on the hominid, hominidae and it shows that we are most closely related to chimpanzees and gorillas and then next to orangutans and the gibbons. And we know that in the gibbons out here, they have shallow invasion of the endometrium. So when the uh, fetal cells are forming the placenta, they do not go as deep into the endometrium in gibbons as they do in the other great apes. And there's minimal remodeling of the spiral arteries in gibbons, and there's extensive spiral artery remodeling in the rest of the great apes. So this deep extravillous trophoblast invasion and the extensive spiral artery remodeling that evolved there gives much greater control over the maternal sub blood supply by the fetus. You can see here fetal tissue invading into the endometrium. There is uh, spiral arteries are coming in here and they are being remodeled by stem cells from the fetus that can actually go in and control part of the diameter of the spiral artery. So when a fetal stem cell is invading the endometrium and inserting itself into a maternal spiral artery, it is taking partial control of the pipe whose diameter determines the amount of food that the fetus gets. That's a morphological example of parent-offspring conflict. It gives the fetus an advantage early in life that it pays for with increased risk of metastatic cancer later in life. Here is the age of some of the major features of human biology, and the purpose of this slide is to show you that different parts of our body evolved at very different points in time. We are a mosaic of features of very different ages. So metabolism is almost four billion years old. Multicellularity, about a billion. Our vertebrate adaptive immune system, about half a billion. The placenta is about 190 million years old. Bipedalism is about seven million years old. And our hairless d skin, our dark skin color and our abundant sweat glands are two to three million years old. So the take home from this is that we are a mosaic of parts with very different ages. Our own history contains quite a bit of complexity since we split off from the chimpanzees. 
The early hominids included Sahelanthropus, probably already bipedal, seven million years ago. Australopithecines, they uh, flourished between about four and a half and two and a half million years ago, were bipedal. They had smaller brains. They probably were frugivorous, ate fruit. At least four species are known. Australopithecus gave rise to and then overlapped with Paranthropus. That was about, oh, from three to one million years ago, roughly. Several species of Paranthropus and Homo coexisted, so there were times in our recent history when there were several hominids living at the same time and interacting with each other on the planet. Homo habilis used tools two and a half to one and a half million years ago, and Homo erectus migrated out of Africa. So there was a hominid species that migrated out of Africa before Homo sapiens. It colonized Asia and Europe. It used fire, it cooked, it hunted and scavenged. It was also cannibalistic. Hand axes from Homo erectus have been found in Spain from about 800,000 years ago. Homo sapiens evolved in Africa, emerged from Africa about 100,000 years ago, paused in the Mideast for 30 to 50,000 years, and then spread out into Asia and Europe. We'll go into this in more detail. In Europe and Asia, we hybridized with Neanderthals and Denisovians and we may have hybridized with unknown hominids in Africa within the last 100,000 years. So we can trace that in our genomes and we can see that people who have been in Europe have Neanderthal genes and people who remained in Africa do not. So to summarize, every organism and trait has a history. Traits have different ages of origin. Organisms are mosaics of parts that have existed for different amounts of time. That has implications for their evolution. The older the trait, the harder it probably is to change it. That's not an absolute, but it is a tendency, a trend. Things that can only evolve slowly do constrain things that can evolve more rapidly. So the old thing set up a framework that constrains the further evolution of the more recent uh, parts of the body. Some traits of medical significance are millions or billions of years old. And every part of the organism and its history is interacting with many of the other parts. So you have to see us as a dynamic organism existing with a framework of constraints, some of which are very ancient.